Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you. And to the rest of you, good afternoon. I'm Margaret Hill. I am the vice chair, and in the absence of Mr. Gallo, our president, I will conduct this meeting, and it's okay for you to take notes and tell me what I did right and what not to ever do again. I have no <laughs> problems with that. That's how I learn. And um, I'm stalling a little bit because we need four people for a quorum, and we know uh, uh, two of our board members won't be here uh, this afternoon or this evening, but uh, we do anticipate two more coming in. So um, I'm going to just do something until they get here. So maybe one of the things I should do for those of you, we might have some new people here, but there might be other people here who say, I know that face, I've seen a ton of times, but I just can't put a name to it. So we're going to start with Gonzalo, and we're going to introduce ourselves and the uh, uh, the areas of our expertise. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gonzalo Avila. I'm the director of elementary instruction, and I'm currently also overseeing secondary ed. Good afternoon, everyone. Maddie Zamora, assistant superintendent of educational services. Good afternoon, Barbara Richardson, director of accountability and educational technology. Good afternoon, Linda Savage, board member. Good afternoon again, Margaret Hill. And I'm glad Ken Martinez is looking at me because I'm not going to tell you that he still owes me dinner from when he was the principal at Pacific and I was at San Andreas. <laughs> Dale Marsden, superintendent of this wonderful school district. And Ken also owes me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Gwen Rogers, board member. Good afternoon, everyone. Perry Wiseman, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources. Hi, good afternoon. Keenan Mitchell, Assistant Superintendent, Student Services. Hello, Janie Christakos, Chief Business Officer. John Poikert, Assistant Superintendent, of Facilities Operations. Janet King, Director of Fiscal Services. Good afternoon, everybody. Harold Volkmer, Deputy Superintendent. Good afternoon. Joe Polino, Chief of our School Police Department. Good afternoon, Linda Bardier, Director of Communications. Hi, and I'm Karen Cunningham, the Board Secretary. Okay, thank you. And, and we just ask Dr. Marston to just give us an update on Mike and Barbara. You bet. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Flores is uh, has a little bronchitis right now, so she's not able to come tonight. Uh, she hopefully will be feeling better soon. Uh, Mr. Gallo just got a text from his wife a little while ago, and they finally removed the breathing tube from him, which is very good news. Uh, he is in ICU. He's recovering very well. I spoke with him yesterday. He was very responsive at Redlands Community Hospital. Uh, he's very responsive and uh, sense of humor. Uh, gave me a fist bump as I left, you know. So he, he actually spent about 20 minutes trying almost unsuccessfully to mouth the word to us. And so he was trying to spell it out in letters with his fingers, and it was awkward. His son was trying to lip read as best he could. And finally, the word he got out was agenda. He, oh. wanted, he wanted to know what was on the agenda. And I said, Mike, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and so uh, he's like, looked at me real serious. And I said, OK. So I, I rattled through all the items we were discussing tonight. But that was the main thing on his mind, is, is the business of the district. He takes that, of course, very seriously. But I'm most pleased to hear from him and from his wife that he's uh, on a trajectory now of recovery and I'm sure he's talking 100 miles an hour right now with that thing out because that's just Mike's style so so glad thank you and for some of you I'll take you on a quick walk down memory lane last Saturday uh, Linda Savage uh, Dr. Morrison and myself and perhaps others in this room uh, attended the memorial services for former <coughs> superintendent, uh, Dr. Chuck Terrell. And while we were there, we had a chance to say hello to Dr. Arturo Delgado. I uh, didn't say hi hello to him, but I saw Dayton Gillian, who is now working for Dr. Delgado. Uh, Dr. Neil Roberts was there. Um, 
the founding principal of St. Andreas High School, Marvin Billings, who's 94, and he was there. Uh, who else did we see? Ted Yet Our county superintendent, Ted Alejandro, was there. And uh, former board mem member, uh, Jim Marinas, was there. Uh, former board member, Shelby Obershaw. Thank you. <coughs> and, um, and former assistant superintendent, Hal Boring. Quite a walk down memory lane, you got me. <coughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Karen. So, as you see, we're still waiting for at least one board member. So, for those of you out there, is there anything you want to ask us? You're going to do your public comment now? <laughs> <laughs> what restaurant do you prefer? Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, some restaurants close faster than, and quicker than others, so uh, you give me a date and then I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Danny's coming in. Okay. All right, I understand Mr. Chilman's here, so now we have a quorum. Um, and we are ready to get started. So, Dr. Del. Fantastic. Dr. Delgado, Dr. Marsden. <laughs> Dr. Dale Marsden, you got it, yep. So, uh, welcome, and this is our opportunity to present to you, uh, board, our uh, California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, known as CASP results. Uh, these are results that uh, the district has received the state uh, level uh, reports back on and then the student level reports will be receiving shortly and mailing those to all the homes and we have a communication plan that's been in play uh, where we've already sent a letter home to parents informing them about the differences with the new setting the new system uh, and also I did a phone call to every parent uh, letting him know how the scores are different and what we're looking toward and how the state's uh, working toward a uh, multiple measures approach. And then uh, we have another follow-up letter that will go out to parents and uh, some education pieces related to that. But uh, Dr. Zamora has prepared a report for you to go over some of the uh, kind of the 30,000-foot level on the results, and she's ready to do that now. So Dr. Zamora. Thank you, Dr. Marston. And tonight, board, um, joining me is Barbara Richardson. She will also be uh, part of the presentation tonight. So tonight, as Dr. Marson said, we're giving you a 30,000 uh, foot perspective on the outcomes as not only they are our outcomes, but also the outcomes as we compare to the county and the state, as well as surrounding districts. So as you all know, if you can follow me to page two, this year is the first year that we receive the outcomes of our standardized assessment that is now the CASP, as it's well known across the, the, the state. And uh, here are some quotes from our state superintendent of public instruction where he does remind us that this assessment is one measure that we should use to gauge student progress. It is not the only measure that we should use, but it is one of many measures that we should use in our schools. On page three, I will have Mrs. Richardson go over this data with regards to the outcomes of our students in English language arts. So as we look at the um, results, students receive an overall score in English language arts literacy and also in mathematics. Um, as we look across the graph, um, these are stacked bars with the, the red being um, the percentage of students who have not met the standard, yellow student, the percentage that has nearly met the standard, um, the green is the percentage of students who have met the standard, and the blue, the percentage of students who have exceeded the standard. Our scores in San Bernardino City Unified are not where we want them to be overall or for our subgroups. Looking across our graph of overall scores and 
ELA literacy, we have large percentages of our students who have not met or nearly met grade level standards. Larger percentages of our students currently fall in the bottom two designations of not meeting standards and nearly meeting standards than in the two top um, bar, parts of the bar. Um, in 2015, in the area of English language arts literacy, 28% of all students um, in grades three through eight and 11 met or exceeded grade level standards as represented by the first bar on the graph. 37% of county students met or exceeded grade level standards and 44% of statewide students met or exceeded grade level standards in the same content area. As we move on to look at the overall uh, mathematics results, uh, mathematics scores across the state indicated the difficulty with shifts into the common core in the area of mathematics learning with only 33 percent of students overall in the state meeting or exceeding grade level standards in this area. One of the areas of distinct change in the new mathematics testing is the amount of language um, that's involved in the mathematics sections. Students are presented with problem solving that involves both reading and mathematics skills. Students are asked to justify their answers, providing written rationale for how they arrived at those um, particular answer choices. SBCUSD's overall mathematics scores are not where they need to be. Overall, only 17% of students met or exceeded grade level standards in mathematics. Our special education, African American, and English learner students struggled significantly in this area. Shifting gears just a bit into um, the science test. The science test is um, still the California Standards Test or CST test. There hasn't been a shift yet to the next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. um, in 2015, students in grades five, eight, and 10 participated in this California Standards Test for Science. Our graph demonstrates a comparison between SBC USD scores county scores and state scores for each grade level. So as you look across, you'll see a group of three bars that represent one grade level. The first three, fifth grade, the second three, eighth grade, and the third three, tenth grade. 36% um, of grade five students scored proficient or advanced in science. At grade eight, 52% of San Bernardino City students scored proficient or advanced. And at grade 10, 37% of students scored proficient or advanced in science. On page six, we um, created a graph that really relays where we are as comparison to the county, the state, and local districts. As you can see, we are below the state and the county in English language arts, and we did rank um, at the same level with Fontana, Moreno Valley, and Rialto, which are districts that are immediately to our, in our surroundings. Um, we also highlighted the districts that we are uh, usually compared to, which are Sacramento and Stockton, and we included the outcomes of two districts um, that we aspire to um, reach the, the, the systems that they have and the outcomes that they have. So in this graph, we can definitely see that although we compare to districts that are in our, um, in our vicinity, we do have great work to do in the area of Eng English language arts. On page seven, we have the same graph, um, graphic for math. And as you can see on, on this graph as well, we did rank again um, at the same level with Fontana, Moreno Valley, and Rialto. And again, there are areas where we need to grow. Uh, math overall for the entire state was a huge challenge. As Barbara said, there is a lot of um, reading and language that is now associated with the assessment in math. On page seven, we do want to highlight that we do have some schools that did extremely well. 
um, the, the, these schools exceeded, I'm sorry, page eight. These schools exceeded the county uh, averages in English language arts and math, and the schools that, are, that have one asterisk also exceeded the state average in English language arts and math. Um, middle college, we just learned and we're very excited to say they ranked in the top 10 across the state. So those are some huge celebrations. On page nine, we have some more schools and these schools um, either exceeded the county average in English language arts or in math and the ones with an asterisk exceeded the state average. As you can see, some of our high schools in English language arts did, ex did well beyond the county average. So those are huge celebrations. I also do wanna say that in our Common Core demonstration classrooms, 83% scored above the district average in e e ELA language arts. So we're gonna shift you for just a minute from the PowerPoint to the packet then that you have that has the three score reports stapled together. Mm -hmm. These are examples of the score reports that are being mailed home to parents. Um, and just to kind of take you through the structure of the score reports, on the front side of the page, you'll find the English language arts overall score and mathematics overall score. Um, you'll see the scale score for the student represented by the number and the little um, box and whiskers um, marking below it. Um, and you'll see that laid over the top of the four achievement levels. So for um, the sc first score report that we're looking at for grade four for Emily, um, they've got the four levels there and Emily scored right at standard exceeded with a scale score of 2,553. As you drop down into the mathematics area, Emily's score was 2,458 as a scale score and you see for that scale score, she um, scored in the area that is the standard nearly met. So when you flip over the page to the back side, right about midway on the page, it talks about the specific four areas in English language arts and the three areas in mathematics that are used to compile that overall score that you saw on the front. So in English language arts and literacy, um, Emily scored above standard in reading, at or near standard in writing, at or near standard in listening, and below standard in research and inquiry. That gives more detail and more direction in terms of Emily's strengths and areas of need within the overall area of English language arts. Um, net right next to that in mathematics, it gives a, a performance score for each one of the three areas associated with the mathematics score. Problem solving and modeling data analysis, where she was above standard, concepts and procedures, where she scored below standard, and the last communicating reasoning, below standard. So this is the structure of the score reports. As you flip to the next page, this is a score report from grade five for Juan Martinez. And the one difference on his report, as you turn the page, is at the bottom. And as a fifth grader, Juan would have also taken the California Standards Test in Science. And it shows there the five proficiency levels associated with the science test and where Juan's um, scale score fell in terms of science. On the very last score report for Chin, Chin is an 11th grader, our sample 11th grader. And again, the structure on the front will be the same because in 11th grade, they take both English language arts and mathematics for all students. You flip over onto the back side and you'll see the um, detail level scores for English language arts and mathematics. Then down below at grade 11, we also have the early assessment program or EAP 
score that tells us Chin's um, readiness for college level work as a junior in high school. And the EAP score is now directly related to those overall scores on the front side of the page. So if you flip back to the front side of the page, Chin scored in English language arts standard met. So flip back to the back side and at the bottom of the page, standard met means that he's conditionally ready for English, um, English work at the college level. So that gives us information on how to help um, get Chen into the right classes as a high school senior to help them be fully um, college and career ready by the time he graduates. Um, if you look at his mathematics score, he scored in level one, standard not met. Flip that back over and in the EAP standard not met means that he's not demonstrating readiness in the area of mathematics right now for college level work as a junior. So these are the score reports that are, are sent home. Um, they are sent home in English. Um, we do have translation guides that we've, the state has recently um, provided for us and we've sent those to all of the schools to ensure that we can get those out to parents as well. Have, have we taken a look at, um, just to get some sense of validity and uh, correlation, did we look at some of the scores for the um, 11th graders in math and look at their grades? And, and does it look like the way they performed on the test is equal to how, they, how they're doing in math and at school? That's definitely something we can do. So um, we, will, we can bring that back to the board. Because before we start making big changes based on this test and placing people in different areas, we definitely should have some confidence that this test uh, gives us a good idea in terms of how well the students are actually doing in math. I, I don't want to take this test for the direction until we, you know, I mean, I know how well my son does in math. So, um, and I know he's good in math, regardless of what this test says, and I know he gets good grades in math, so I have no doubt he's going to be successful in math. So I don't know how he performed in the test, but I definitely wouldn't want to get to a point where we say because of this test, we're going to change something we're doing. And I think you're, um, Mr. Tillman, you're spot on with the message that's coming from our state superintendent that this is one measure of many, that we should not be um, uh, taking this as a sole indicator of student achievement. There are many other measures internal to the school and to the district that can be used to gauge a student's level. Um, but we can definitely bring back a, an analysis of grades and results in 11th grade math. Um, I, I just want to mention that last year that I went to one of the classes that they were taking the test and one of the students finished within five minutes. So we have to also look that a lot of these children didn't really, um, you know, take this, not necessarily to take it serious, but they finished fairly quickly. Even some of the teachers there were kind of mm -hmm. concerned that mm -hmm. they weren't um, taking the time that they needed. So that can be also um, taken into consideration that uh, many of the children were not necessarily prepared yet to take this test. And I think that goes along with the paradigm shift. We're used to paper and pencil and multiple choice. This is a much more rigorous um, computer adapt adapted test. And so the students are getting used to the new way of being assessed. And it's definitely something we need to take into account. Yeah. So on page 11. Before you go on, as I took a look at this, uh, I think it's maybe your third, maybe, no, it's your second page in, uh, under Emily's results, results on the California assessment. If I was a parent, I'm not sure I would understand what any of those meant. Are we sending out a separate sheet to parents? For instance, as a parent, I would want an example. You know, for instance, a student should be able to do A, B, or C. So, I think it would be good if we could send something in parent language so that they understand when it says uh, demonstrating understanding of literary and nonfiction texts, you know, so they would understand that. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And on page 11, as we um, think about our next steps, these are some of our next steps is 
full implementation of K-12 curriculum, which is our Common Core State Standards through the continued um, use and updating and revamping of our rigorous curriculum design units. Um, continue to work around strengthening of the alignment between instruction and student performance expectations, the new expectations of the Common Core. Uh, utilizing this assessment as one indicator, not the end-all, be-all. Continue deeper implementation of instructional rounds to enhance teachers' use of effective instructional practices. Increase and increase opportunities for embedded technology use in the daily teaching and learning process. And as um, I just want to reiterate that um, we know that we have room for growth and we are up for the challenge. Our teachers are up for the challenge. Our principals know that their um, role is crucial to the academic achievement of our students. And we are all part of this new paradigm shift that is called Common Core State Standards. Thank you. So the way we formatted our board workshops, board is, as you recall, we'll have a brief, as you just experienced, 15 minute staff presentation, then it's a time for the board to dialogue, questions and answers, and we can always bring back additional information as the board needs that. And then the board may choose to engage the public if they have any comments or discussion on that. And then during the board meeting itself, you'll notice there will be a brief moment. For those that weren't in attendance now, they'll come to the regular meeting, they'll hear just a very brief elevator speech giving a, that captures the essence of the presentations now. Um, and so this allows the board maximum time to dialogue around the topic to your, to your pleasure. And then next board meeting, we'll bring back and showcase best practices around these results. As you saw, some of our schools are doing very well. What are, what are, what are they doing that's causing that to happen? And we'll talk to you about that. I guess a couple of questions. Um, is this meeting going to be televised? It's televised, yeah. Okay, good. Because I think it's important that the public gets some understanding of you know, where we're at with this. Um, and then, you know, I, I had a real concern with the results of the third graders. Uh, uh, and it's not in here anywhere, but I looked at the original results that came out in the packet. And um, actually, I looked at the results that came out online. And I hope we, we get some type of, do us an assessment to determine, uh, you know, what's the reason for the poor performance at that third grade level. Because you think, to me, that's critical because that's the start of the process. Now, so I want to know whether there was something at the third grade level that was more um, difficult or if technology played a role and should we be working on getting students that are in the first and second grade access to technology so when they get to the point where you're taking a test at third grade, it's not the first time they touch the computer because all that I think can um, come into play. When you have students that come from different areas that are more affluent, then of course, they'll be a lot more familiar with technology than students who don't have it um, in the household, which goes to my, I mean, we, when the, even the devices that we tried to get out, um, we started in third grade. We might wanna look at giving devices to students in first and second grade, just so they can start getting, uh, building dexterity and um, uh, building a working knowledge of how to use technology, and they don't see it for the first time in the third grade. Because I know for a fact that with my kids, because I work in technology, they, they were working with computers from the time they could walk. So they'd be at a great advantage than a student who only saw a computer for the first time in third grade. I think that's something we should look into. Good, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. Also, I want to comment to that as well because I had an opportunity to speak to one of the students at North Vermont, and she actually shared with us um, her peers' um, concerns. The concerns was trying to navigate being on the computer. And I know a lot of times we look at it and we think because a child can get on a phone and press the buttons and oh, how advanced they are, but this was totally different um, for those students. And I believe she was a fifth grader. And also um, the concern that she had was that some of the fear of her peers, um, I guess they, I'm sure they discussed this after, it was the fact that, that as it was progressing and getting harder, they just kind of got stuck, you know, and didn't know what to do. So we have to take those things under consideration because this is new. And I know when talking with her, I thought back to the pen, pencil and the paper, you get to erase, erase kind of look at it, but this is a little bit more pressure uh, on it, on those uh, results. So we want to take those things under consideration. Thank you. Ms. Savage? 
I, I look at this and I, I, I'm amazed that the parents are gonna have this much information. Uh, I think it's wonderful, but the point is we gotta do something with this. So I'm hoping that each school, each classroom, you know, the parents will be able to be brought together and say, okay, for this classroom, here's what happened, here's what we need to do, and here's where we're gonna be going. So that when we see a first or a second grader, but the third grade, you know, they're having problems with the computer, but okay then, first and second grade, like they were saying, we've gotta be sure within that school that those little ones have that opportunity before they get to third grade, because that's half of the problem, I think, in a lot of this situation. Ms. Medina? Well, I, I believe many of us already figured that this would be um, something of a struggle for the, for the testing. I do want to mention that this is, because uh, there might be many where it's what well, Common Core didn't work. Uh, and, and we have to know the difference between the Common Core and the testing. And the Common Core does work, the testing is completely different, because I, I just want the audience and for those who are listening not to consider them both the same. Um, they're very different. Common Core is a way of learning and the teaching in the classroom. This is just a test and the, the SBAC is a test that um, the kids is online and, and, and they will struggle. And I've taken the test and it is pretty difficult and it's not easy for, um, you know, for some of these questions. So definitely I think that uh, we are low. I mean, the numbers do show that we are low, but this is a learning experience that we're mm -hmm. definitely going to move forward with it. Okay. So you, you took, how were you able to take the test? Online, there was a sample mm -hmm. test. You sample can do it. Test. Yeah, you yeah. can go on there and take yeah. a sample test. It, it you pick the grade, and uh, you can but do that. No, I, I personally think the jury is out on whether or not this is good or bad. Right. I mean, if we look at the, the, the test results, and if they if we find out that it is representative of how well the students are doing, mm -hmm. if we realize that it's not the way a math problem is worded that is making, and especially if it's worded in an unrealistic way, because you know, I really think that historically, we presented math in a way that makes it more complicated than what it really is in real life. Mm -hmm. So if we find this is m m more of that, that's not a good thing. And uh, I think we need to be realistic. And that's why when you say you looked at the test, yeah. I'll go out and take the sample test, because I think yeah. it's critical that the adults in the room um, go out and look at this and, and do determine whether or not this is a good thing or is it something we're going to struggle through for another five years before you, somebody else comes up with the next, uh, whatever they want to call it, um, right. test. It's no different. I mean, I, I, I say it all the time. Every four or five years, someone comes up with a new um, way of educating people just because that's what they want to do, whether it's no child left behind or race to the top, whatever you want to call it. When I was in school, everything was a set and a subset and, a, uh, you know, and no one does sets and subsets <laughs> anymore. But that was the new math and they act like that was the math we're going to do for the rest of our life. You never see it anymore. So, you know, to think that this is something great, I'm not convinced yet. Uh, but if it, and we, it's up to us to determine how much of it is um, going to benefit our students. And we need to, I think we need to determine early um, how much um, how much emphasis we want to put on it, and how much we uh, and, and making sh and I, I have no problem with doing it if it's going to benefit the kids in the end. And I always say the tests that matters to me are the SAT as long as they use them. They don't use them. I don't care about them anymore. Uh, the test to get into the military, the test to get jobs, the test to get your driver's license, the test that in real life uh, uh, make a difference. The test you take as a freshman in math and English. Um, those tests, you want to prepare our kids for those tests because that's what dictates how well they're going to do in life. Uh, just, a, just taking a test for, for the sake of taking a test doesn't mean anything to me. So but, I think we need to concentrate on that. But Mr. Tillman, I also think though that this is something that we, we have today that we know now that here is the test and we, we've seen what our kids have done. And I think that with the uh, uh, tests that can be taken to practice on before I mean, just the fact of being able to bring that to the parents at an early date when school first starts and says, here's what your kids are gonna be faced with. Here's what they are. Let's all sit down and take this test, second, third, whatever it's gonna be. But say, because that will give a reality so that, you know what, my kid has no idea what's going on here, or yes, they do, 
but we need a le learning process in the beginning because let's face it, we're stuck with this now for a while and it's something positive that we've got to face as a unit. All of us have to buy into this because that's what we've been told we need to do. Thank you. And, and, and Linda, I, I, I agree with you. My only concern would be this. The 11th grade is, is a great place to start. Say we look at the results of 11th grade and we find out a number of the students tested below but they have A's in algebra and geometry. Uh, and, and so how does that compare with the test? And do, yes. we, and do we care that uh, a student that has stopped in geometry by choice uh, but, and, and mastered it well, and if they had kept going, they would have did whatever math, but that person has been deemed somebody who failed on this test, we should know that. I mean, those well, those I, are the kinds of things our parents need to be aware of. Exactly. Yeah, you know, if our parents are aware of these things, it'll be much easier for them to go one way or the other and making sure their kids have a positive experience. Right, and and I guess so. What I'm looking for is something tangible. If 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 we say that the kids who didn't do well in the third grade is because they weren't reading at third grade level, right? Yeah. Or it, or the kids that didn't do well on the test were at third grade level but you had to be performing at fifth grade level in order to, do, to meet the standard. Those are the type of things I want to know. Okay. Well, I have, I have two concerns. Um, I, I spoke with a teacher who said, we were prepared, my kids were prepared, I know they were prepared and they did not do well and she felt it might have been not knowing the keyboard and not being that familiar with the, uh, uh, with the, the kids using the um, computers. What I like to see done of, of all of our students, maybe we could do a random sampling, especially the students, the teachers can identify the high performing students in the classroom. And maybe we need to find out from them, what do you feel, what helped you get over and what were your stumbling blocks? But I wouldn't ask everybody, I would just do a random sampling of those uh, uh, who are high performing students. But, you know, we, I think, and I don't think we've asked the kids, you know, what, mm -hmm. what was your stumbling block? So if we could do that. Or even asking them if what did, if they took this really seriously, did they answer really quickly? Like sure. I said, that one student that just it was finished within five minutes. Sure. And that way we can realize, well, we need to work on how to help the students take it uh -huh, more serious. You know, I, I think one thing that we can't lose sight of, and, and that's the fact that if you look at the districts that are similar, in terms of de demographics, they perform the same way. And to a large extent, this test decides how to label these districts. That's right. And not necessarily because they're saying that they should be um, performing differently. Or that, so I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing. Somebody have to give me some type of explanation to make me, to convince me that somehow this test showing, uh, and I'll give you a good example. If you look at what we're doing with the AYP and how we have progressed to the level we have progressed to, and now for somebody to say, okay, all the schools that were in the 700 series, we're gonna start you back at 300 again, is that a good thing? Because in my mind, that's what they're doing. Instead of be, having a positive incentive where we're still marching towards the 800 and 900 level, to me, they've reset the, uh, the measuring stick and said, no, you're not, so you, yeah, we, we, before we were saying you were jumping seven feet, but now we said now that seven feet is only three feet. How, how is that a, a, a good thing? To me, you could have kept the same level of scoring and just increased the level that you wanted to reach, but at least gave credit for the uh, progress that you had made in terms of the level we were teaching kids at before we switched tests. So thank you, board, and definitely all the requests. We wrote those down, and they are all doable. We will bring that back to the board. Uh, uh, one last thing I would say. Uh, when we did the, the process before, we were really concentrated on tests. The one thing that made a difference was the money that we invested in terms of uh, people and processes at the sites that had the most challenges. There's no way of getting around that. I hope we don't take an approach that we think the results will be better next year by not making major investments right. in, the, in the groups and in the schools that have um, scored at the lowest levels. We have to do that. Uh, and if we haven't set aside money to do it, then we need to look at 
um, changing the way we're spending our money because in the end, whether we want to or not, we're going to be held accountable based on these test scores. So I just hope that uh, we don't think there's some way of increasing the test scores other than uh, putting extra resources in the areas where the most needs are. And, and Dale, could that be part of the next uh, workshop where that's included as well as what um, the funding looks like if we were to invest in additional funds for that? For the best practices, you mentioned there was going to be a best practices version of this, right? Where they're going to show. Oh, good which point. Yeah, in terms of uh, yeah, at, at the next board presentation, correct. So what we'd look at is what are recommendations and policy implications. Okay. So for you as a board, if there are financial implications to that, what that would look like. I personally think it's probably premature till we have a little trend to kind of see how things are going. Okay. Um, but we do want to get a jump on it as soon as we can. And so we'll bring back some recommendations to you at that point. Good, thank you. And because we have a few more minutes, anyone out there? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Nancy. That's okay. You were, I was sneaky. Nancy Sanchez Spears, uh, SBC, it's San Bernardino City Unified School District mm -hmm. employee. And as far as looking into best, best practices, I listen to these discussions and I think, and I usually don't speak, I usually go through Robert, but he's not here tonight wishes everyone well and wishes uh, Mike a speedy recovery. He's advocating for public education in Washington, D.C. right now. But I, w I would like for us as a district to take a real close look at the QEI QEIA and SIG school programs and what is the common factor, if there is one, that made the schools succeed the way they did. If there is not a common factor, what is it precisely that we can find out about each individual school that made them succeed. We can use those practices and duplicate them in schools that are alike or similar to, to the schools that we receive that funding. We can't fund everyone that way, but we can start looking at what worked, and it's not going to work everywhere, but it will probably work at a similar school. Good. Thank Great. you. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Cabinet members? Anyone? Thank you for the report. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. And we'll, yes, five o'clock closed session, and hopefully we'll be ready to be out here by 530. Thank you.